Okay. Oh. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear us now? Hello? Hi, can you hear us now?
mic is working, but um, I'm making you mic. What if I'm I don't think so. Can you hear us now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Hey, John, we hear you. Yeah, you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Should I hang up Thank the you phone so now? much. So, John, we'll be starting in just a few minutes, and what we're going to okay. do is call up the panelists, and okay. Gail, will, our chair, will deliver brief opening remarks, and then you guys will just line up and give your three-minute prepared remarks in order. So we'll, we'll cue you. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, okay, thanks. You're gonna... Why don't you like just stick around for a few minutes? Because I, I can. Right. Can you hear that? Can you hear? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I was talking to someone else. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to today's public meeting of the 2019 New York City Charter Revision Commission. I'm Gail Benjamin, the chair of the commission, and I am joined by the following commission members. <laughs> the Honorable Sal Albanese, Honorable Lillian Barrios Paoli, Honorable James Karras, the Honorable Lisette Camillo, Honorable Eduardo Cordero, Sr., Honorable Lindsey Green, Honorable Satish Nuri, the Honorable Dr. Merrill Tisch, Honorable Carl Weisbrod. With those commission members present, we have a quorum. Uh, before we begin, I will entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the Commission's meeting on January 31st at City Hall, a copy of which has been provided to all of the Commissioners. Do I hear a motion? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. Today, we are very excited to kick off the Commission's series of expert forums on the focus areas we adopted at our meeting in January. Today, we are privileged to be joined by a distinguished set of panelists put together in consultation with my fellow commissioners who have generously agreed to speak to us about our elections buckets. In the interest of time, we're getting started right away. Each panelist will have three minutes to introduce themselves and provide brief opening remarks. And there will be a clock, which is over there, that you can consult as you're speaking. Um, and then we will have 30 minutes for questions by the commissioners. If 30 minutes ends up not being enough time for all of the commissioners' questions, please let staff know, and they will arrange a follow-up. For brevity's sake, I'm going to call up the witnesses, but I'll ask that each of them introduce themselves briefly within their statements. On this first panel to discuss ranked choice voting and related election process reforms, we have Karen Brinson Bell, Susan Lerner, Bella Wong, Craig Burnett, be a video, maybe wave Mr. Burnett. Oh, John Arnst. Ah, uh, okay. Esmeralda Simmons and John Arnst. Opening statements, um, Ms. Bell. Is that on? Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners, and thank you for having me. My name is Karen Brinson Bell. I've conducted elections for more than a decade, including city and district instant runoff voting elections, and was part of the implementation team for the statewide ranked choice voting election of the North Carolina Court of Appeals seat in 2010 which was the first statewide use of RCV in the U.S. since the 1930s and was implemented in just 86 days. I am here today representing the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, which is a non-advocacy, non-profit organization focused on education and sharing election administration practices. I believe you're familiar with what ranked choice voting is and the term instant runoff, so I'll go into why jurisdictions adopt. Uh, it includes to eliminate costly, 
low turnout runoff elections, avoid vote splitting and weak plurality results, enfranchise military and overseas citizens, and increase civility in campaigns. Currently, RCV is used in 11 U.S. cities, including Minneapolis, Minnesota, San Francisco, California, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Santa Fe, New Mexico. In 2018, the state of Maine used RCV as it, at its state and federal primaries, and then for the U.S. House and Senate general election. 18 additional cities and counties have also approved RCV for future elections. Some key things to factor in from administration and implementation. First, it is no different than any other election. Implementation of RCV for a jurisdiction follows many of the same protocols and procedures used in any election. It is a proven voting method, and we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We have materials freely available for sharing. With good instruction, voters do understand RCV. Voter education can involve as little or as much of the resources available and permitted, and some jurisdictions conduct extensive public education campaigns, while others, like North Carolina and Maine, were given no additional funding and had to educate their, educa uh, their efforts at a minimum of resources. Previous implementations have proven that the most impactful and inexpensive voter education method is verbal and written instruction when the voters present themselves to vote. Additionally, New York City's voting equipment is RCV ready. With the equipment you have in place, uh, you can move forward with RCV ballot design and vote capture, and the vendor does provide RCV tabulation software as an additional module. Last but not least, we have data from recent elections in Santa Fe and Minneapolis to illustrate that voter understanding and proficiency in marking RCV ballots uh, is, is just a very low voter in, uh, rate. Often, uh, just one-third of one percent of ballots are removed to voter error uh, in Santa Fe, for example. I got it in. <laughs> wow, that's a hard uh, act to follow with seven seconds to spare. My <laughs> God. <laughs> Thank you very much, commissioners, for inviting me. I'm Susan Lerner. I'm the executive director of Common Cause New York, and I'm one of the founders and leaders of the statewide Let New York Vote Coalition. Um, Common Cause is a national organization that works on issues to strengthen our democracy. We are involved in election reform and improving election administration all across the country. Uh, my colleagues in different states and different cities have the uh, hands-on experience uh, that Karen has with ranked choice voting. But I'm here to talk about our situation here in New York City. First, I'd like to say from our perspective, there is no one magic silver bullet in terms of one election reform that will fix everything that anybody wants to see in our election system. Getting our elections right requires the right combination of reforms. And finally, in Albany, we're beginning to see some of the reforms that we need to help tackle some of the problems. But here in New York City, I believe we are uniquely situated to benefit from ranked choice voting. And that is because of our admirable and well-regarded campaign finance system. Our campaign finance system results in our having a large number of races which are multi-candidate races. Combine that with our uh, term limit system and repeatedly what we see uh, not only in our citywide offices but particularly at the council level and most particularly in the primary, uh, races where you will have anywhere from four, five, six, sometimes eight or ten candidates who are running in the same election. Witness our current special election for public advocate. That uh, situation has uh, the benefits that come from our campaign finance system have the unfortunate side effects of sometimes having a very split uh, ticket uh, where people are afraid to vote for their first choice. They're afraid that if they vote for who they really uh, support, that a candidate they really don't like, a la Donald Trump, might be elected. Um, and they are uh, confused uh, in terms of whether their vote is going to count. We also see the unfortunate situation where you have elected officials who come into office without a really strong majority behind them. Ranked choice voting addresses these issues. 
It, uh, it eliminates the spoiler effect. It allows people to vote for their real first choice. It encourages the candidates to collaborate. Um, and it allows the ultimate winner to be able to say that they are the consensus candidate who has built the strongest support in their community. These are all good things which strengthen our democracy. And that's why we at Common Cause have provided for you a proposed amendment to the charter which would set up a top five, a rank your top five uh, ranked choice voting system. Thank you. Is that in this um, handout that you there, gave us? There's the, a lengthier handout which has our analysis of the multi-candidate races and a separate sheet which our proposed language for the charter revision. Thank you very much. Ms. Wong? Hey, uh, let me make sure this is on. Should I talk into, great. All right, good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Bella Wong. I am the chair of the Voting Reform, Reform Initiative at the League of Women Voters in the city of New York. Uh, we are a multi-issue, nonpartisan political organization. We promote informed and active participation in government uh, at the national, state, and local level, although I am here representing the local level. Uh, so we're very pleased to see the commission is exploring the implications of ranked choice voting. Uh, we've supported this process for a long time. Uh, in the start, we advocated for it to be implemented uh, for the special nonpartisan elections that fill city council vacancies as well as for absentee and military voters. Uh, we now actually recommend that it be implemented in all city elections, including city council and citywide positions. Uh, as Susan pointed out, the public advocate uh, special election and actually just the history of public advocate elections really highlights the need for ranked choice voting. The 2009 and 2013 citywide Democratic primaries uh, required runoff elections uh, after no public advocate candidate received 40% or more of the vote. These elections each cost the city $13 million, uh, had a 7% turnout, uh, tomorrow we have an election where there won't be a runoff, uh, so with a 17 candidate field we very well may have someone win with 25, 30 or less percent of the vote. Totally feasible. Uh, similarly, although they are not subject to a runoff, city council races may have many candidates in the primaries leading to situations where the winner may receive only a small plurality vote. So we're in favor in large part because this reveals voter preferences, right? We want more information about what voters think, not less. If we know voters can rank three or five people, that gives us more information. So uh, because of our interest, we looked for some alternatives and we've done a little research reaching out to other League of Women Voter chapters around the country. Uh, in some cases, they spoke to us directly. In other cases, they directed us to uh, colleagues at places like Fair Vote, for example, uh, talking to tell us about their experiences. Um, so just a few results from our research last fall. Uh, some people have suggested the process is too confusing for voters, but actually uh, as uh, Ms. Uh, Karen point, pointed out, uh, exit surveys in the Santa Fe municipal elections in 2018 indicated increased voter confidence in the quality of the result. Uh, I actually personally went to the Maine June, June 2018 and mayor of Minneapolis in 2017 just election results. Uh, both of these, the Board of Elections or whatever organization runs that, uh, was kind of to actually put every stage of rankings. And so I looked through and I found that actually um, in Maine, and I think this is the first time we used it, about 80% of voters uh, during that primary selected at least two candidates uh, for mayor of Minneapolis. I think it was the second or third, maybe third time they've done it. 87% uh, of voters actually voted for at least two candidates. Uh, and it's not like people are necessarily ranking one through all of them. Uh, so in Minneapolis, you can rank up to three. Uh, Susan here has pointed out or has suggested that we be able to rank up to five. Uh, we're pretty agnostic, but three to six is where we think. Um, and we found that in Maine, uh, only about 8% ranked all eight, 80% ranked two, so at least two. So, you know, there's a fair amount of use. So uh, that's just one bit of the research we did. Happy to answer questions on more. Thank you very much. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Esmeralda Simmons. I'm the executive director of the Center for Law and Social Justice at Medgar Evers College to the University of New York. Uh, I'm very happy to be here tonight to talk to you about ranked choice voting. Uh, I'm going to speak to it on it from the perspective of the area in which my center operates. We're voting rights attorneys and we have for the last 30 plus years urged election reform that would benefit um, particularly racial quote unquote minorities in the city of New York. Um, 
I'm going to speak from history in New York City. Uh, ranked choice voting, which has been called several things, uh, cumulative voting is the most common way uh, it's been described, uh, has, was already in effect in New York for a very short period of time. It was from 1970 to 2002, the operation under which the method, under which school board elections took place. That ended <laughs> when mayoral control came into New York City under Mayor Bloomberg, and he um, changed the law so that there would no longer be um, elections, school board elections. When that change was about to occur, every single voting rights practice um, that represented communities of color, Asian American Legal Defense Fund, the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund slash Latino Justice, the Center for Law and Social Justice came before um, the hearing and asked that this not occur. We testified. We went to the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. and asked for it not to occur. Why? Because it had been a tremendous success for communities of color in the city of New York. Indeed, the first Asian elected in the city of New York was elected on school board election. Um, I went and researched and came across a report by Max Rubin, it's in my testimony, in which he says that ranked choice voting, he called it preferential voting, I believe, uh, was that it was an overriding, on the balance, I recommend that proportional representation and preferential balloting be continued. He showed that there was near exact uh, opportunity uh, uh, as represented by population for, for Latinos, for blacks, and for Asians in ranked choice voting, and that the confusion dissipated after the second election. I think ranked choice voting would be excellent in the city of New York. It uh, provides small communities or smaller communities a choice to indicate their choice and to have representation uh, that truly reflects their candidate of choice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Great. John? Hello. I'm John Aronson, the Director of Elections in San Francisco. I've been the director. Uh, I was the director in 2004 when the city implemented ranked choice voting. Uh, I've implemented ranked choice voting on two different voting systems. I expect to implement ranked choice again on the third system this, for this November's election. Uh, we've had three rankings for the last, what, 15 years in our ranked choice contest. And for the upcoming November 2019 election, we expect to have 10 rankings on our ballot. And that's my introduction. Thank you. And um, Mr. Burnett will be the next speaker. Don't go away. Hi, Mr. Burnett, you're on. You're up. Yep. Okay. Um, I won't spend a lot of time talking because I've actually uh, provided a, uh, uh, a pretty comprehensive list of things I, I would like to flesh out. Um, the one thing I would like to get across, though, to everybody uh, is that um, there is no perfect system to count votes. And it is important to keep that in mind because there are a lot of people who tell you the positive and negative things of this system or that system of which uh, you know, IRV is one of them. Uh, but I would uh, be sure to highlight some of the potential negative things about instant runoff voting because people, you'll find plenty of people who tell you the positive aspects of this. The first is, and I think pretty, uh, pretty key here, that, that ranking more than one candidate is indeed, in fact, more difficult cognitively than any single choice. Uh, this is not necessarily a problem in high information environments. A lot of voters can kind of figure things out when they're talking about the presidency, for example, where there's a lot of information. But as you go down the ballot, as you get into more difficult to find uh, races that have more difficult to find information about who's running, what do they stand for, 
uh, ranking becomes an even more difficult task. And so uh, I would caution that the commission think about that as, as they move forward and looking at this carefully. Um, the other I would actually highlight, which is the majority of my research, is that instant runoff voting does not usually actually produce a majority winner. It usually produces a plurality winner. Uh, and that is because of the fact that most elections that use instant runoff voting uh, have a, a, a number of spoiled ballots due to uh, ballot exhaustion, to no fault of voters' uh, own own mechanisms of filling out their ballot. They end up just not counting in the final vote. Uh, and this has been true in, in, in just about every election I've looked at. It's very rare, actually, that instant runoff voting produces a true majority winner. The final thing that I would I would highlight here, and I'm happy to talk more about it, is that uh, there's some initial research out there, some of it's my own, which I go through uh, pretty carefully in, in my written testimony, uh, that instant runoff voting actually may be harmful to uh, minority voters. And we don't really fully understand uh, the implications of this yet in the academic community, where we are starting to get more information and more uh, research into this area, uh, but it certainly seems to me, and this is the point that I made first, that it is cognitively more uh, costly that uh, minority voters aren't necessarily in the best position to be able to rank because uh, uh, of the candidates that are available. Um, my own research has suggested that uh, it actually, uh, uh, precincts that have higher rates of minority voters actually have a less complete ballot. And as a result of this, this makes them more susceptible to exhaustion. Uh, which means that they don't count the final tally. And so this is uh, all for you to consider. And I, I, in my testimony, I list very much the positive aspects too. So I don't, I don't want to see them as if I'm just totally negative on this. It's just that every system comes with a, with a series of trade-offs. Thank you very much. Um, now, are there any, are there any commissioners who have any questions, comments? Mr. Harris. I guess I'm curious, and this is for any anyone, everyone. Uh, I'm curious to know, in a, what experience do you all have with sort of further down the ballot races, like a local council race in an open seat, because you know New York has term limits when there are a dozen candidates running. I'm just concerned that you know I'm I keep up with. I've worked in city government for 30 years. I keep up with it. And I'm lucky if I know one or two council candidates in an open seat. So if there are a dozen people running, do you, could, could you come across a situation where people are just sort of after the one candidate they know, they're just randomly assigning numbers and come out with sort of bizarre results as a, as a result of that? Whichever one of you um, would like to. They're looking at me. So mm -hmm. I will say that in my, my early experience in 2010 when North Carolina did do the statewide use of RCV, it was part of the general election ballot where we had about 20 other contests also on the ballot, and this was for a North Carolina Court of Appeals seat. So you can imagine that that's already considered a pretty down ballot race. We had 13 candidates and 86 days to implement with no... Uh, no additional funding, as we've talked about. Um, and voters were still able to execute their ballot. Um, we had a, you know, a successful, we went into a recount, we did a sample audit of the contest. So um, I feel like it, you know, that's a prime example. Minneapolis would be another example. They even use ranked choice voting for their Parks and Rec Commission. Um, and in, let me go back to my notes. I didn't read this part to you, but uh, in 2013, they had 35 mayoral candidates on their ballot, and the error rate was similar to what they found in 2017, which was about one-fifth of one percent of the ballots had an overvote error in 2017, and 13 was comparable with 35 mayoral candidates. So I know that's not down ballot, but uh, M Minneapolis has seen good success over their three uh, uses. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, I actually would like to go back to the thing I was saying about uh, how Maine voters uh, voted, and that was for governor, uh, so it's a fairly high information thing, so that's not quite getting to that part. But 80% of voters in that primary select at least two. 8% ranked all eight. 
I think this is pretty consistent with voters stopping when they run out of candidates to rank. Some will choose to rank all, some will choose to rank two, some will choose to rank one. Only about 20% ranked one. I think this is reasonably consistent with voters understanding what they're doing. Obviously, you can't be sure, but that would be, uh, I think, evidence. Also, uh, we spoke to uh, a uh, former uh, election commissioner in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, which obviously has been doing ranked choice voting forever, and they're hyper-local. Uh, and what we were told was that there's a lot of variation in how people vote, uh, but they never really go past the fourth or fifth instant runoff round, uh, even on the Mac side. So uh, I think there's a fair amount of evidence that pe voters are behaving how you think they would. That's not direct evidence, but I do think it is suggestive. So, you know, we have ranked choice voting in uh, four different uh, Bay Area um, t uh, cities uh, in California. Uh, San Francisco yeah. has the experience of the Board of Supervisors, Oakland, uh, and uh, San Leandro, and I'm forgetting the uh, the last one, which may be Richmond. I'm sorry? Berkeley, Berkeley right. Um, they uh, elect their council there. Uh, and, you know, again, the figures are that the vast majority of people uh, are able to rank. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, a lot of the clickbait uh, is based around ranking that we see online. Uh, so uh, if the advertisers think that listing the 10 best places to spend your winter vacation uh, is going to get your attention, they must know something about how people think. Thank you. Um, I could also add... Um, uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. Sorry. Dr. Tish had a I'm, question. I'm just curious. To me, it sounds like a... To me, it obviously sounds like an idea whose time has come. But I wonder, I wonder about impact on um, large communities who have been disenfranchised from the vote. You spoke articulately about school board elections, and those were notorious for having no one come out to vote, right? So I'm wondering, in all of your vast experience with this, are there cities and urban centers that are comparable in population to New York? who have done this successfully without having um, a, an impact on disenfranchised voters? So I think you would have to look to the experience at the state level because there is no city comparable to New York in our country. Um, but certainly there are uh, large cities in other uh, countries uh, which use the ranked choice voting. Australia uses a, a uh, what they call alternative vote, which is our ranked choice <clears throat> voting system. Um, and I think actually that the evidence would suggest first that ranked choice voting is pretty neutral as far as turnout is concerned in any particular community. Um, that there are a number of factors which impact turnout um, and ranked choice voting doesn't have that much of a negative or a positive effect uh, that I can see looking at the various data. But what it does do, and I think this goes to your point most importantly, is that it avoids the spoiler uh, allegation, uh, which is one of the things which particularly often underrepresented populations uh, Candidates who come from those populations, if you have more than one candidate from that community, are, are often told, well, you shouldn't have two or three or four candidates from your community because you'll split the vote of your community and then uh, somebody from outside of your community will end up representing you. Ranked choice voting uh, very directly impacts that problem uh, that we see, allowing a multiplicity of candidates from that community to run, which has the effect of attracting more people from that community to vote and allowing them to vote for their true first choice and not worry about spoilers. So I would say uh, that I think it's, it is neutral at worst and may perhaps be helpful at best. Um, would you like to add anything, Mr. Yeah, John, would you like to oh. add anything to that answer about the experience in San Francisco? As far as how turnout is concerned in, in some communities versus others? Yes. Yeah, I agree. I don't think ranked choice either hurts or, or helps turnout in any, any community uh, itself. And as far as the, the rankings are concerned, I think people understand how to mark the ballot. That's one thing that your elections department will have to focus on is, is to teach people how to mark the ballot. 
that's see that's more important than they even know how ranked choice voting actually works is they, they can actually mark the ballot correctly so they can participate in the election fully um, but there is certainly more outreach that has to be done to people where english isn't their their first language or they have limited english uh, skills and also the folks who don't vote often are the ones who need extra outreach around the ranked choice voting uh, because it's something that they potentially have not been engaged with at all uh, during their voting uh, years. And we see that in San Francisco. So outreach is a huge component of this, but I don't think it, I don't think the ranked choice voting either hurts or, or helps uh, the, the turnout totals. Uh, what, uh, Sal was next and then I, Lisette. I'd like to have your comments on what uh, uh, Professor Burnett stated that uh, uh, his preliminary analysis shows that racial minorities tend to have lower rates of battle of ballot completion that is ranking the maximum number of candidates allowed could do you comment on that uh, has any research been done on that besides what Mr. professor burnett has pointed out so you know um, i have a, a fairly detailed analysis of his work which i must admit i don't have uh, at top of mind uh, but we uh, believe that uh, there's been some selectivity uh, in the communities that he is looking at, and I'd like to submit a written answer in greater detail. Um, that would be impossible. This is an unpublished piece of work. Well, can, is it possible you could send it to Ms. Lerner? Uh, no, this is something that would go through the peer-reviewed process that are publicly available, so she's welcome to redo the analysis if she likes. Um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to point out that that's just incorrect. She does not have a close analysis of my data. Um, this isn't cherry picking, it's the data from 2011 and 2010. There's no cherry picking. It includes every single ballot that was scanned during that election. Is it possible you could send the committee some? some type of synopsis that we could review since there seems to be interest it's it's included in part of your uh it's included part of your uh written testimony there uh it begins on page page three um while we take a look at that we would be happy to receive any written comments that you would like to send to us we about your will. understanding of this this issue. Uh, I would also I would also add there is a peer reviewed publication that I cited in my testimony as well uh, by Jason Daniel, which calls into question the degree to which IRV is harmful or helpful for turnout. And his conclusion was that it's not necessarily good for minority voters either. So I'm not the only one who is who has highlighted this. Uh, and the full citation is on page four. It's uh, the last plus it's on page four. And of course, uh, attached to my um, testimony, my full written testimony is an analysis of the impact on both minority voters and uh, women vote, I'm sorry, minority candidates and women candidates um, in the four Bay Area cities. I would also like to add that it, as part of my testimony, I um, submitted a quote from um, Lonnie Guineer, one of the premier voting rights uh, scholars in the country, in which she uh, absolutely suggests that um, right choice voting would be beneficial to uh, quote, uh, communities of color or voters, um, because, in quote, um, it allows voters to accumulate their vote in order to express the intensity of their preferences. In this fashion, interest representation strives to ensure that groups that are politically cohesive, sufficiently numerous, and strategically mobilized will be able to elect a representative of their choice. Now, she's speaking as a uh, voting rights attorney formerly with the Legal Defense Fund, who is very familiar with all types of system and was promoting uh, ranked choice voting as the system of choice for minority voters. Wasn't she at that time promoting ranked choice voting as a system 
that would allow for minority, I don't mean minority with a little m, not minority meaning people of color, but would allow for minority representation as well as majority representation? Wasn't she, that part of her she was, whole she analysis? Was, she, she was stating that, um, that winner takes all uh, was objectionable uh, for a democratic society. Um, and, and, you know, that's her book. That's the title of her book, The Tyranny <laughs> of the Majority. Um, and she's pushing for several things, one of which was ranked choice voting. The other thing was open elections without district and ranked choice voting combined. Um, and uh, she was also pushing against, uh, against runoff elections as injurious to minority community voters. The uh, drop-off, the voter fatigue of um, the runoff elections are really, really dramatic. Uh, and one of the things that ranked choice voting does is that it allows all of the voters who uh, come out uh, to rank uh, the top five candidates and not worry. Uh, and we don't have to be concerned that sometimes the runoff here in New York City has had a turnout as low as 8%. I think that... Um Sal, were you next? Or did you ask your question? Then Lizette was next. And then Lindsay and then Carl. There are 15 minutes. I just had a, a very quick question and I'm curious. Um, in your experience or in your research, has, has there been uh, any other jurisdiction that has instituted ranked choice voting but then has gone back um, to undo instituting ranked choice voting and why? So there are two jurisdictions that that have, um, and from you know I have I haven't delved completely deeply into both of them, but what it appears relatively quickly is that the political climate changed, um, and that a lot of the arguments had little to do with actual ranked choice voting, uh, and more with a, a change in the political winds as to which party was in control. Uh, but we'll have more details uh, in that regard for you as well. Which, I'd appreciate that. Which, which were they? What cities, what jurisdictions were they? Uh, Burlington, Vermont, um, and I'm going to mangle whether it's um, Tennessee or Kentucky. Karen, can you help me? Actually, uh, Pierce County, Washington, That's right. and Burlington, Vermont are the two that um, there are a few other examples. Actually, the history of ranked choice voting goes all the way back into the early 1900s for our country, um, including in New York. Uh, so what historically, Susan's correct, it had political um, issues. Party bosses didn't want to uh, know that they weren't in control of the elections. We also saw the introduction of the lever machines, and they could not handle ranked choice voting. Uh, some of the more recent repeals had somewhat to do, again, with some court rulings in Pierce County, went back to a, uh, to a two, top two primary system. Uh, so that was a court ruling that changed and, and caused the repeal. Um, and also, again, it was some issues with, um, with voting equipment. In the last few years, all the, the four largest voting equipment vendors in the country now support ranked choice voting within their system, including what's here in New York. And I've provided an example ballot uh, based on a previous race. So um, the, the repeals that have occurred um, have a little more to them. We can give you some details on that as well. Okay. Thank you very much. The next person is uh, Commissioner Green. Hi, thank, thank you all for your <clears throat> testimony tonight. I was, it's an open question, not necessarily directed at, at anyone, um, but can you shed some light on transition times that other jurisdictions have adopted to sort of once it's agreed or voted upon by the voters that they'll switch? You know, what is the, what maybe has a set of best practices or even more importantly, this was too short a time frame to transition for the voters from when they knew about the change to, the, to the, the, the first election that would implement it? That's actually why my organization exists. We're all former election administrators who are sharing best practices to help um, in that transition period. As I mentioned, North Carolina for a statewide use had 86 days from the time that the vacancy occurred um, to, to implement. We even had a workaround because our voting equipment wasn't capable um, and to do our statewide education. 
um, to over 6 million registered voters. Uh, other jurisdictions have done it on a shorter time, short time frame as well. Maine, uh, in preparation for their primary, was less than 100 days. And Santa Fe, New Mexico, while they had adopted it many years ago, um, once the voting equipment became available, they actually implemented within two months. So, but we would encourage as much time as you can provide, but that is achievable. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I would note, uh, yeah, uh, these have often been achieved on sort of shoestring budgets very quickly. I don't necessarily recommend that, but it has happened and people have successfully voted. Uh, actually, although uh, in terms of best practice, Minneapolis actually conducted a sort of test election in May 2009. Uh, I think they picked like sort of a smaller election than I think just did a test run to estimate how long it would take to do, how much staff it would take, how long it would take, and I think that was like a really good practice. Um, generally speaking, I think Minneapolis did quite a good job, and I would encourage looking into their sort of practices as a way to see what is a good way to implement things. And certainly if this commission were to recommend and give the voters the opportunity to decide if they wanted ranked choice voting by putting the uh, proposition on the ballot in November, uh, it, you, there certainly would be a, a very substantial lead time before we have our 2021 uh, elections for uh, the vast majority of offices. Carl? Um, this is a question to Dr. Burnett. I, I just don't understand, uh, maybe you can explain your um, second, with, I guess third bullet point regarding potential negative aspects of instant runoff voting where you say instant runoff voting does not in general produce majority winners. Does that mean that in where instant runoff voting is in effect, there is a lower likelihood that um, it will produce a majority winner without IRV being implemented or um, or is it, does it mean that the first past the post um, plurality winner is ultimately not likely to be the winner after IRV is implemented? Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on in your question there, so I'll, I'll do my best to unpack this for you. Um, I would have you look at table one. Uh, that's on page two, just to give you a sense of what exhaustion is, and that if you look at it, what I'm saying is that, and, and this is response to the claim here, and, and you'll see um, that some of the panelists have, had sort of thrown this out there, that ranked choice voting gives you majority, uh, and, and there's sort of a sense that, that that's what it's supposed to do. Uh, and it was sold that way for a long time, and what the 2015 paper, which these tables are based on, uh, clearly shows that that really doesn't happen. Uh, in fact, if you look across the country, most of the time, and even in San Francisco, this last election did not produce a majority winner, produced a plurality winner, which it means that the winner of that contest wins with less than 50% of all the votes cast. And so exhaustion rate gives you a sense of what percentage of the votes that were cast didn't make it into that final tally. And as you can see, it ranges um, about 10% in most of the Three, three of the four elections. But one of them, San Francisco, in this particular year, uh, it was 27% of the ballots didn't make it into the final tally. For reference, this year, San Francisco was about 8.5%. So we're testing that to that 9 or 10% that we, that we see. Now, your question of whether or not the IRB winner is going to be the same as the primary runoff winner is a very interesting one. Unfortunately, it's one that we can never know. Uh, we don't know what would happen, for example, uh, if the people who were, had their ballots exhausted were given a chance to vote on the final two candidates that made it to uh, the election. Uh, we don't know, uh, we do know something about what they do in a primary runoff, which is if they choose not to show up, they're expressing basically no opinion or they didn't have uh, the interest that was enough to actually go out and vote. So this is something for black box. The exhaustion rate raises questions about what are those voters thinking? Uh, what would they have done if there was a choice in front of them? And would that choice have changed the outcome of the election? The answer is, and I would suggest you know, that the commission think about this very carefully, is I don't know, nobody knows, and there's no way to know. 
So, so I, I'm, if you're breaking up a little bit, so I might not have captured your entire answer, but it seems from what you're saying that the your conclusion that IRV does not, in general, produce majority winners is more accurately said, we don't know. Well, we don't know what the majority is. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, in San Francisco, in, uh, in, in this election that we're looking at here, which I think was uh, 2010, maybe it's a camera right here on top of my head, uh, they had 27.1% of the voters in this ballot not make it to the final round of voting. This means that we don't know who 27% of those voters preferred when uh, out of who remained at the, at the end of tally votes. And that is something we can't know when their ballot is exhausted. So what we do know is that it's definitely not a majority. That's not a majority. 33.4% of the votes act constitutes a plurality winner. Uh, and this is not a problem that you can simply say goes away with adding more choices. Important the election 2011 allowed them to rank everybody. There were 15 components on the ballot. 18 percent of the vote was exhausted by the time of the ballot. And the Supreme Court, uh, the most recent one, statewide man, well, not a not a majority winner, a plurality winner. Ms. Could I could I ask for a clarification from John Arnst, who would be able to tell us how do you report yes, you may. the winner uh, when you when you've gone through the different calculations? Do you say what do you tell the public? So the so ranked choice in San Francisco, the, the it's whoever has the the most remaining votes. So. There is a chance that there's a lot of candidates on a ballot where uh, the winner doesn't have the majority of all votes cast. There is a, has a majority of votes that are remaining. Uh, we don't we don't go into detail about remaining votes when we announce the the results. We just indicate that someone received 50 percent plus one of, of the votes for that contest. Exactly. So, so the public comes away with the sense that that person has been elected on a consensus basis at a minimum rather than a situation where we have seen uh, runoff candidates here uh, who get uh, a, a shockingly low percentage. So even if it were an abstract plurality, the voter perceives the candidate as having a majority. And if we're looking only at the at the number of votes cast, we're seeing a plurality that's very, very close to a majority, as opposed to a plurality winner who has 24 or 30 or even 32 percent. So however you cut it from an academic point of view, it's better off because you have more support for the winner. And in terms of how uh, the information is actually conveyed, um, what the voter sees is somebody who has built a consensus across communities and has the strongest consensus support, and that is healthy for our democracy. Whether That's we quibble exactly about true. the uh, abstract uh, relative or uh, ultimate majority versus a plurality of 48 percent, um, again, the perception, I think, is very healthy for our democracy. We have a consensus winner at a minimum. That's not true, actually. Uh, the fact of the matter is when you have a primary runoff, you tend to have a majority of the people who participate in that runoff election. It tends to actually produce a majority winner. Now, you can take issue with about, you know, drop off and votes from one election to the next, but that's a separate <laughs> issue. The idea that 48 percent is close enough, so let's call it a majority, is not, and this isn't an academic uh, position. This is this is just a strict mathematical position. Okay. Constitutes a plurality winner. Okay. The last wait, time wait, 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 the Democrats had a majority wait, winner is when the the incumbent won, and they didn't really even have to go through the process of ranked choice voting. Thank you, um, but I have a question. How many iterations um, do does the election board generally go through? Um, when there's a large number of candidates in order to call the election? You can go through several rounds of counting. The number of rounds depends, um, like you said, on the field, but it also depends on the 
rules that are adopted, if you allow for batch elimination because you've got so many candidates down here at the low, you know, at the bottom with so few votes that they mathematically could not win in any standpoint, and you allow for batch elimination, then the number of rounds are reduced. Um, the do other all thing of the states have and localities that have implemented ranked choice voting also have this batch elimination? Most have gone to that. We can provide you, we actually have a chart that shows all the rules that have been adopted by the different jurisdictions and what they allow for. Include. That would be helpful. I am old enough to remember and to have voted in the school board elections. Um, and they were difficult. Um, and it is certainly true that the collaboration about which you spoke happened, having been uh, a part of it, that people can try and arrange things. Here, I mean, community board is somewhat different because there are more than one person who is being elected. And in the elections we're talking about, it's only one person. Um, so it's not really comparable because in the school board elections, we just arrange things so that I would vote for this person as my number one, and then I would get another community over here that's part of my community to vote for my another candidate that was part of our coalition as the number two. So they would both, um, in as far as I can tell, in, in rank order voting with one candidate, that's not really possible. That's why I was so interested in how you and when you eliminate candidates. Is it just that the candidate who doesn't get the number on the first ballot is eliminated, but all of those people who get the number, whatever that number is, remain in, and then the votes are recalculated based on the number twos, threes? The, the lowest vote getter is eliminated, and then you move to the next round of counting, and the lowest vote getter, uh, those, those votes are then redistributed to that candidate's, the voter's second choice, third choice, uh, however, depending on where you are in the rounds of counting. Um, you know, one of the things to consider is, <clears throat> and this is slightly different from what you were asking, but, you know, when you look at runoffs taking place and whether there's a majority in that outcome, the major it may be a majority because there were only two candidates, but when you get down to it, if you only had 8% of the people participating, then a majority of voters did not elect that person. By having ranked choice voting and condensing it to one day, you've got one day of people coming out to vote, expressing their preferences, and they don't have to figure out childcare, employment, if the train's working, or anything else to return for another day of voting. And our testimony analyzes the history of New York City's uh, multiple candidate races and the runoffs, um, not looking uh, at how it may have worked in other places and aggregated, but look at our specific situation. Now, experience and academic research uh, indicates when you're talking about uh, a collaborative situation that candidates, that there is a much uh, more civil um, campaign atmosphere. Candidates will uh, set up uh, coalitions uh, with uh, ideologically similar candidates or candidates within their communities or cross communities where uh, the argument is uh, you may choose uh, candidate A as your first choice, but uh, I would like to be your second choice. I understand the concerns of your community. Um, and we have uh, some anecdotal evidence uh, from a gubernatorial candidate in Maine of exactly that kind of collaboration. They've seen it in San Francisco. Uh, we've seen it in Minneapolis and other places. And uh, as we go through the kind of mudslinging that we're seeing for the public advocates race, um, looking forward to it being repeated for a uh, primary uh, and a general election. Um, I think that we would all like to see a more civil uh, atmosphere for our multi-candidate races here in New York City. Uh, I really Thank you. Our, time. Our, our half an hour is up. Um, if you have additional questions, um, I would hope that you would ask staff, um, and I would hope you would let staff talk with you. Um, as we conclude this small portion. Um, I know that you're going to give us additional writings. I hope all of you will. And if, based on the tenor of our questions, if you have additional thoughts, we would love to hear them. Um, but we do have two more panels, and so I'm afraid 
that we need to uh, thank you very much and to ask you to please continue to engage with us. These are important questions, although I think we can all agree that the most important election issue is trying to make sure that more than 8% of the people get out and vote. Absolutely, and thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, um, the second panel, which regarding redistricting, um, we are ready to start that now. Um, Ms. Simmons is staying with us and will be joined by Jeffrey Weiss, Michael Lee, and TJ. Costello, who was on Skype. Um, once again, uh, each one of you will have three minutes to make a presentation, and then we will have 30 minutes of questions by the commissioner, uh, the different commissioners. Um, I will give first preference if there are questions from commissioners who have not already asked questions, I will give them first preference. Mr. Lee, would you like to start? I can. So thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. Um, and so on the redistricting front, um, there's both good news and bad news for New York City. The good news is that New York City has a system that is overall pretty good when it comes to redistricting. Um, in that it has a lot of the right pieces in place. Uh, there is a commission that draws the district maps. Uh, the commission in the past has been competently and in fact very well staffed. The commission has held uh, voluntarily an abundant number of meetings and it's done a reasonable job of engaging the public in the process of drawing maps. So overall the system has worked well. Um, the bad news is, or perhaps the opportunity is that there, it still, is a process that is very susceptible to being politicized. And, and by politicized, I mean not necessarily in the Democrats versus Republican sense, because this is a very democratic city, but politicized in the broader uh, sense of politi politicization. Um, and the biggest weakness of the system probably is that there are relatively few checks on who gets appointed to the commission elected officials, the mayor and the legislative leaders pick, um, the gold model would be to replace that with a um, fully independent commission. Uh, cities like Austin and San Diego have, have moved in that direction. Um, but we would recommend at a minimum requiring elected officials to pick off of a screened list uh, prepared by a neutral body, perhaps something like the uh, New York City Campaign Finance Board. We also would recommend putting in writing hearing requirements to allow the public to participate meaningfully. Uh, as I said, past charter commissions have done a good job of this, uh, but ensuring public participation will be especially important this go round, given the demographic changes that have taken place in New York and some of the hard trade-offs that will have to be made in places like central Brooklyn. Um, we also think that it would be a useful thing to um, require a supermajority to approve maps. Right now, maps are approved by a simple majority. Um, and we also think that there's an opportunity to strengthen the protections for communities of color, uh, particularly as areas get more diverse. Uh, there's a question of which neighborhoods or which groups you keep together. Um, and, and putting in writing that um, making sure that communities of color have the ability to elect is an important change. Um, in your packet, you have some materials that outline these and other recommendations. These were originally submitted to the Mayor's Charter uh, Commission, um, as well as some materials relating to the Brennan Center's overall views on uh, good commission design. Uh, and with that, um, we're, I'm happy to answer questions at the appropriate time and to be a resource. So thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Okay. Uh, my name is Jeff Weiss. I'm a fellow at the State University's Rockefeller Institute of Government. 
Uh, my comments tonight are my own, not reflective of any university policy. Uh, I testified before this commission in late September, so I don't want to repeat everything I said uh, previously, uh, which really focused on updating the charter to reflect the lack of having Section 5 review by the Justice Department. Uh, that reference to the Federal Voting Rights Act might be sufficient. Um, I talked a bit about whether the commission ought to be independent. Uh, that's a judgment call. Uh, I think that legislators or legislators who uh, report back to a legislative body can redistrict responsibly as long as there are fair, objective, ranked criteria, which the New York City Charter you know, does have. And I served as counsel to the, uh, the post-2000 and post-2010 post council and commissions, both which received very prompt Department of Justice approval under the Voting Rights Act Section 5, and neither of which were challenged in court uh, whatsoever. Uh, I also think, uh, in as a change since I was last here, uh, the um, state legislature has changed the primary schedule for elections from September to June. Uh, in 2014, the state voters approved a constitutional amendment uh, creating a state advisory commission to recommend to the legislature congressional, state senate, and state assembly lines. And that commission has a deadline of January 15, 2022 uh, to uh, recommend a plan to the legislature uh, with petitioning starting for this year's calendar, I believe tomorrow, uh, that might leave time for uh, the Board of Elections to redraw as necessary election districts to comport with new assembly districts. But looking at the city council manic schedule, uh, which currently takes you into the third year of the decade for the, tw the third year council manic elections, you uh, might want to consider changing the deadlines for the commission or whatever you choose to you know, draw council lines so that the lines are in place by the end of uh, the second year of the decade so that elections petitioning can be held in an orderly manner beginning uh, in 2013 and in subsequent uh, decades. Uh, I've had the pleasure to uh, talk with your staff since the last commission hearing. I've shared uh, material with them, especially uh, a review I did in a book called New York's Broken Constitution on the state process. And um, it's a pleasure to be here again tonight and answer any questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Simmons? Hello again. Um, I had the pleasure uh, to serve as the vice chair of the initial 1991 Districting Commission. Um, and I'm proud of the work that we did in that commission. Uh, but since that time, there have been changes. Uh, the first major change that has occurred uh, is that New York City is no longer uh, covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, in addition to that, uh, after uh, the commission did its work, uh, a group of citizens led by uh, uh, Richard Ravage brought a lawsuit to take out language out of the charter. Uh, that language was language that said that there should be uh, proportional representation uh, by race on the, on the redistricting commission. Uh, I believe that with those changes, that the present composition of the formula of the commission, which I've laid out in my testimony, is currently skewed against black and Latinx voters. Um, why? Because it requires three members to be appointed by the, by the council from the party that has the second largest delegation within the council. That party is usually the, has been historically the Republican Party. Uh, and that party has received less than 4% of the vote in the New York City general election. Yet, under this provision alone, not even coupled with mayoral appointee, the Republican Party would be given 20% of the votes on, on the Districting Commission. Second, um, this charter, the charter as it stands has a no majority clause um, within it that virtually guarantees that the majority of the membership of the commission will be white New Yorkers. This will occur notwithstanding the reality that the majority of New Yorkers today are Latinx, Black, and Asian. Uh, I therefore recommend that the uh, charter be amended to include permissive language, such as, quote, the appointing authorities should strive to have the commission reflect the city's racial population. 
This specific language, while not a mandate, not a quota, may serve as a reminder that racial composition is important. The language would prove to be a positive step toward achieving racial equity uh, and in actually and actually allowing the criteria that's already within uh, the commission, um, the districting commission, to be uh, implemented. I lastly, I recommend that this commission establish what I call the New York City Voting Rights Commission. That commission would basically serve as a local um, uh, voting rights commission that would be similar to the role that the Department of Justice played uh, under Section 5. Uh, other jurisdictions, such as the state of California, have their own uh, Voting Rights Act, and there is a Voting Rights Act that's also before the State Assembly to have a local Voting Rights Act. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Costello? Uh, thank you very much. Um, my because we're still an active board, my prepared remarks are derived from our final report, which I believe I sent um, to you. So thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about the Austin Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, or ICRC. My name is TJ Costello, and I currently serve as vice chair of the ICRC. On November 6, 2012, 61% of Austin voters answered yes to a question which asked in part, shall the city charter be amended to provide for an independent citizens redistricting commission? Passage of this charter amendment ensure that 10 single member districts be drawn by the commission of 14 independent citizens. Serving on this 14 person commission would include voluntary eight year terms with no pay and long hours for the first six months, at which point maps would be drawn over 500 individuals applied to serve. To lessen the possibility of political agenda or conflict of interest, the ICRC had strict eligibility requirements placed upon it, and a group of three independent auditors whittled the applicant pool down to a list of the top 60. In May 2013, from this pool of 60, the initial eight commissioners were selected at random. This initial group's first task was to choose the remaining six commissioners to achieve specified diversity goals for race, ethnicity, age, gender, and geographic representation. In the end, the commission had a very similar demographic makeup to the city as a whole. Seven commissioners were women, seven were men, ages ranged from 22 to 72, and included a required student represent representative. The commission met in full for the first time in June 2013, and shortly thereafter chose our chair, and I was selected as vice chair. The ICRC spent countless hours ensuring that our process was fair and impartial. The process was extremely transparent, enabling full public consideration of all comments on the drawing of district lines. We held over 40 open meetings, which included 14 public hearings held throughout the city. We solicited verbal and written testimony, had 532 in-person testimonials given in three-minute sessions by 400 or 18 Austin residents. We witnessed seven invited presentations involving 22 speakers and received 566 emails or letters from Austinites. The commission labored, sometimes excruciatingly so, to underscore independence from Austin City Council at the time. While we did have a city liaison, we also hired our own executive director, our own legal counsel, and mapping consultant. We established our own website, managed our, own, our marketing and communications. Most important, we strictly adhered to the city charter upholding the law throughout. We were guided by eight major principles, including the U.S. Constitution, the Voting Rights Act, and the concept of communities of interest. On November 18, 2013, just six months after formation of the ICRC, Austin made history. It became the first city in the United States to have city council districts drawn by a completely independent group of ordinary residents not selected by a legislator, judge, or other public official. The ICRC unanimously adopted our final district map for Austin's first 10 member city council. In the end, we had immediate acceptance, zero lawsuits or challenges, 72 candidates run for 11 positions, and the city council has had a 40% turnover rate since. I, we, the RCRC considers our work a success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Satish is first, and then um, Jim, and then Sal. No one's too far. Thank you all. 
My question is for Mr. Lee. Um, can what Mr. Costello described in Austin be accomplished in New York City? It, it certainly could. I mean, the, the Austin model really follows closely on the model that was used in California, um, and um, it has produced really good results. The model in California has produced really good results, particularly from the standpoint of ensuring that the, the, the um, the commission is diverse um, and 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 um, you know has a lot of transparency and public participation. I will say that you will have to build in enough lead time for because getting set up with the commission means you have to set up a process for screening the applicants, interviewing the applicants, giving you know and and getting people up to speed because these will not be people who have done this before. Um, and um, and then you, the timeline also has a lot of room for hearings and and you know public comment and so on and so forth. Um, but it it certainly can be something that has been done. Um, and um, yeah, absolutely. Jim, uh, my question for Mr. Lee or whoever else on the panel would like to uh, respond. Uh, can you point to specific uh, instances where under the current, uh, re for, for in, in terms of uh, those of you who are proponents of uh, more independence for members of the redistricting commission, uh, instances where uh, there have been districts drawn in, a, in an unfair way and in, in a political way, problems that a more independent commission would have solved? Um, I can't point to any specific districts where I think there, there were sort of problems, um, but you know, one of the goals of a, um, a more independent redistricting process is to make sure that you get community input. And you can certainly do that even if you don't go all the way toward an independent commission like Austin has done. Um, but you know, the, 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 the desire is to really make sure that that whatever um, decisions are made are driven by um, community input. And that's gonna be, again, especially important given uh, the demographic change in New York. It is going to be difficult to maintain, for example, all of the current African-American ability to elect districts in Brooklyn, just given the, the changes. Um, and it's important that the people of those communities shape what those districts look like, right? Um, because there are lots of different ways that you could go given this new reality. Um, and it's important that, that um, public input shape that, and not only along racial or class or, or other lines, but uh, among other dimensions. And so the example that I always like to tell is from California. It's not a city redistricting, but it's the, the state of California redistricting. And in Los Angeles, um, some of the people argued for a district to be created, a state assembly district to be created in the foothills of Los Angeles, which it actually would join together very disparate communities and you actually can't drive through all of the foothills. You have to drive down into the valley and then back up. And so in a lot of ways, and people every day, they go down into the valley to shop and work and go to school. Um, and so in a lot of ways, joining the foothills together in a district, um, you might say doesn't make sense, but the people went there and they testified and they said, you know, we have one overriding concern that isn't getting addressed in Sacramento, and that's wildfires. Um, nobody pays attention because we're just a small part of so many districts. If we, we feel like if we were all part of one district, people would pay attention to us a little bit more. And the commission made the decision to draw that district. Now, could they have drawn other configurations of that district? Sure. Um, that would have been perfectly reasonable um, as a choice. Um, but they heard testimony from community members, um, and they thought, you know, they were independent enough to say, you know, you know, given, set aside all the other ways that we could do this, we think that this is actually something important. And then the next election, you had Democrats and Republicans but er, running, and everybody was running, talking a little bit about wildfires and what they were gonna do to prevent them or make sure that communities had resources. And that's something that the drafters of the California process wouldn't have envisioned. They, they never thought we'd have a wildfire district. Um, but, but the, you know, because you had the right people in there who were really sort of like, um, had been screened and vetted um, to make sure that they were like people who um, were good listeners and sort of like weren't, didn't come in with an agenda. Um, you know, I, I think that that um, is, is um, 
as an example how the process could work. Now, converse to that, um, there are, you know, there are much, there are commissions where people are appointed as in New York, like in Washington State and elsewhere, and uh, in New Jersey. Um, and what you see in those is a tendency for um, the commission members to come in with some kind of objective. And it's not necessarily, I'm going to favor Jeff Weiss or do anything like that. Um, it is, um, they, they sort of have some kind of predetermined um, outlook that they, they might be able to move off of that, but you have to move them off of that, whereas in, in, in where you have independent commissions, um, people much more, or it's like jury, right? You select a jury of people who are willing to sort of listen and, and, and participate in the process in good faith, and they don't feel that they're there to do the bidding of the person who put them there, um, and they're not conducted in, the, in that way necessarily, so. If I could just add, the last few commissions that I worked for for the city um, had representation from the mayor, uh, the speaker, and the minority leader, and often, you know, political considerations, what the members themselves wanted, played a role. Uh, my role with the commissions on point was to serve as the out, as the council to be good cop, bad cop. Essentially, because of Section Five of the Voting Rights Act. My job was to look at the districts with the assistance of a qualified political scientist who determined the level minority population, voting age population, each district had to have to maintain uh, Section 5 compliance, which essentially required that the new plan not make the minor leave the minority community any worse off than it had been in the previous plan. So out of 51 districts, if you had, I'll say, 33 effective minority districts in the old current plan, you had to have at least 33 in the new plan, and that was based on a really a line in the sand number that uh, the Supreme Court um, accepted in a 1985 case that basically would say this district must have a 45 or a 52 percent minority voting age population. Uh, and I told the members, unless you draw the districts at these levels that we recommend, then the plan you know, is in jeopardy both at DOJ and before the courts. And that worked effectively. Without Section 5 uh, you know, um, anymore, then you know, that, that safety net, that break shield isn't there. And you might want to consider something in uh, any kind of revision to the redistricting sections to address that uh, issue. That's the closest, I think, that the uh, New York plan would come to any, uh, something like gerrymandering. Sal? I, I've been through a number of these uh, redistricting uh, commissions as a council member, uh, and I'm familiar with the process, and there's always skepticism on the part of the public uh, about whether this is a fair process or not. And I think Mr. Lee pointed to it very, very well. Uh, look, w when Appointees are political insiders. Uh, they may have the greatest intentions. They may be great people, but they're appointed by folks that have a vested interest in the process. And the, how the lines are drawn, despite the guidelines, there's still a skepticism on the part of the public. You hear it all the time. This is rigged. It's fixed. Uh, my question is, we have a model that's a gold standard in Austin, Texas, uh, which seems to be based on what I've heard and what I've read, a really objective and independent process that's been tried in California and it's worked. What, Mr. Lee, the question I have for you is, what would be the objective of implementing that here in New York City? What would be the, the negatives of that? Well, I, I think there are a couple of, I, I wouldn't say negatives, but um, potential challenges in, in, in implementing an independent commission. And this is something that you saw in Austin. It's also something that you saw in California um, and elsewhere, which is that um, you want to make sure that you have, you know, it's, it's very easy at one level to make sure the commission is diverse and all of that. Um, but you want to make sure that the people who are on the commission actually are sophisticated enough to um, ask the right questions and to engage with their staff and to, to um, get the job done. Um, and that can mean making sure that the applicant, the right people apply. Um, and in both Austin and in California, um, that was a little bit of a challenge initially in the sense that 
Um, the, in both places, the applicant pools initially were overwhelmingly male and white, and in California, it was mostly white males who lived in Sacramento, right? And, and um, in Austin, it was a handful of zip codes of, of where people really pay attention to politics or generally well-educated and, and whatnot. And so it took a lot of effort to go out and to um, fund groups to do the outreach and to get people um, into, the, into the mix um, and to make sure that, you know, you actually had the right you know, true representatives of the community and, and truly impartial people, um, as opposed to um, um, some, you know, like, a, you know, a, a more superficial thing. I will say um, one thing that can be helpful in that is like making sure that you don't disqualify too many people from serving on the commission. And that was a little bit of an issue in Austin because they were very strict on like what you could have done with, in politics. Mm -hmm. um, so you had to have voted in a lot of elections. Um, and, I think Mr. Um, uh, Costello would also like to sure, respond. Sure, sure. Um, so you, you, I'll, I'll, let me just finish the, uh, the one point, and then I, um, you, you had to vote it in a lot of elections, but at the same time, um, you couldn't have given too much money, you couldn't have worked for a campaign, and um, that disqualified a lot of people, particularly in communities of color, where people would have done like relatively what we would consider low-grade campaign work, delivering yard signs or things like that. Um, you know, help, and that disqualified some people who were qualified. So you have to design it really carefully, but it, it certainly can work and, and um, has done well in Austin and done well in California. Um, but you do have to think through a lot of the design features. Mr. Costello? Yeah, the, the one thing in Austin, you're, you're correct. There was uh, very large restrictions, but a lot of the people on the commission were very active in their own, in their own way. I, I'm very active in the community. A lot of the commissioners are active in their own way. But one of the ways they got around some of the things Mr. Lee talked about was the first eight commissioners were literally picked out of a hat. Um, the sixth was whittled down to a pool of 60. Uh, we, you can argue whether that was the best 60 representatives of the city at large or the people who want to be involved, et cetera. But eight people were picked out of a hat. And they were charged to pick the best six of the remaining 52. And that picking out of the hat thing really uh, helped move, uh, have representation around the city. And in a matter of fact, the one area that was missing people and they had to fill out of that remaining six was probably the most active area in the city. Um, so that is one way they got around it. So if you think, and also we have four county commissioners uh, regions and there had to be one person from each region or two people from each region. So if you think of it from a New York City standpoint, there has to be one representative or two representatives or whatever the number is from each borough. Um, so there's a lot of ways you can go around it, but um, Austin, there was a lot of restrictions, don't get me wrong, but in the end, it really worked and there was representative, representatives from every corner of the city. If I could, if I could just Mr. add, if you, if you want to, uh, consider a completely independent process. One threshold question is who would administer the process? I am familiar with the California Commission. I did work out there for the state Senate in 2011, and the state auditor, who's an independent uh, political player uh, in the state, uh, administered the process. You'd have to consider who in this city, which is so predominantly one party oriented, would run the process. Reverend Miller? Yeah, thank you uh, for your expertise. Um, have there been any, any challenges in Austin or California or Arizona or otherwise regarding uh, political forces or political interest groups that may want to circumvent the independent nature of such commissions? So I guess some people abide by the political philosophy uh, rules are meant to be broken even when the rules are fair and make sense. So, so have there been any challenges regarding maybe forces that champion the status quo that would try to circumvent the independence of yeah. um not really i mean there there have been you. there have been some allegations in arizona that um the the chair of the commission was really who was supposed to be an independent there there are two democrats two republicans and an independent who serves as the chair that the chair really favored one party over the other um, and, and there were allegations about that, but it doesn't seem to be reflected in the maps, and those challenges really haven't gone anywhere. Um, you know, there was a lot of politicized effort to remove the chair and, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but in general, um, you know, I think people would tell you that the process has worked really well in both places. There were certainly legal challenges, but they were resolved fairly quickly, it, unlike in the states like North Carolina and Texas and, and elsewhere where maps were drawn by political, um, the political bodies and, and litigation is ongoing even nine years after they were drawn. And so um, the process did work better. And, you know, part of the reason why, um, you know, sometimes people think like the, the, the goal is to get like the perfect commissioners, right? You know, the angels who are going to be there and never sort of mess up. Um, the, the framers of the Constitution and the founding, the founders of the country knew that like people weren't angels, right? So they, the, the key really is um, you do want the best people on there, but you want a safety guard, which is having checks and balances, right? So the commission should be a fairly large size, you know, around 15 members or so. Um, you want like approval standards that mean that like even if you had one or two rogue commissioners who got through on the process, they weren't going to be the determiners, right? You know that that you know like you know they might try to argue something and they might win here or there, but they weren't going to be the drivers of the process, right? And so there's a healthy check and balance. And so in California, for example, there are Democrats, Republicans, and um, independent third party people, um, and each bucket has to approve. So um, and and so you have to have approval overall, and then in each bucket, and so that's an important check and balance um, in the process and there are others that are in the California system and elsewhere that um, help help make sure that even if there are bad commissioners who get through um, that that it doesn't um, affect the, the process. The other thing I will say is that the transparency really helps a lot. In California, everything was streamed online. It was broadcast on public access television. To this day, you can download it all and watch it if you are so inclined from the very first interviews with commissioners to the final vote on the, the maps. And people would email comments in real time um, and, and, and they would respond in real time. And so the transparency helps a lot. People will police the process if if, there, if, the, if the process doesn't occur in a, in a back room. Thank you. Mr. Costello, you wanted to add something to that. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, with, with Austin, we didn't have a problem. We have a very strong area in Austin that's very politically involved. And it's one of the reasons why the 10-1 passed. Um, and, divert, and so we'd have districts instead of at-large uh, council. But what we found is um, there were some folks from that community who did try to, through public testimony, uh, try to sway members who may not have been as uh, savvy or been on commissions before their way. And the best thing we did, and the chair and I, we worked very hard on this, is to get an independent uh, legal expert on our team. And we were able to rely on that person um, extensively. We did not, it was not a city appointee, it was our employee. And we paid their bills for the budget. Yeah, okay, the city gave us a budget, but we paid that person. That independent legal expert uh, and our independent uh, uh, executive director really, really helped keep people in line to understand uh, what they're allowed to do. Thank you very much. I just have one question, Mr. Weiss. How much, do you remember what the budget of the redistricting commission? I don't remember the budget, but the, uh, the commission's records are still intact somewhere on the city's website. <laughs> I'm sure it's uh, something available from the um, city budget, that, you know, the councilmanic uh, portion of the budget. But I don't recall the number. I wasn't involved in the budgeting end of it. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions? If not, then I thank you all very much, and I hope that you will be available afterwards for additional questions or concerns as, as members read and think through all the materials and have additional concerns. Thank you very much. And finally, um, our next panel is on campaign finance um, and will be joined by Frederick Schaefer and Amy Lepresque, Michael Malbin, Wayne Barnett on video, 
Jennifer Herewig, Alan Durning on video, and Jerry Goldfeder. Um, after you've taken your seats, if you could go ahead and introduce yourselves and share your initial three minutes. And then we will again have 30 minutes of questions. Uh, again, I will give preference and questions to members who have not had any questions, um, if they so choose. If not, we'll just go in the order in which you raise your hand and ask to be recognized. Okay. Yes. Uh, good evening, Chair Benjamin and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Frederick Schaefer, and I'm Chair of the New York City Campaign Finance Board. Uh, with me is Amy Loprest, Executive Director of the CFB. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony uh, today. We are proud that New York City's public matching funds program has served as a model campaign finance program for more than 30 years. Jurisdictions across the country are adopting programs modeled after our own. <clears throat> Governor Cuomo has proposed a matching funds program for the state, and H.R. 1, the Democratic bill in the House of Representatives, includes a small dollar multiple match program like ours for congressional campaigns. The CFP is always looking for ways to make our program better by working with the City Council and previous Charter Revision Commissions. Last summer, the Board made recommendations to the 2018 Charter Revision Commission significantly, uh, to significantly lower contribution limits, increase the matching rate, and increase the amount of public funds that campaigns can receive. These recommendations were based on data and aimed to transform the ratio of big dollar contributions to small dollar ones, especially for citywide offices. As you know, the Commission recommended and the voters overwhelmingly adopted substantially similar changes. We are also seeing changes in fundraising. Uh, I'm sorry, we are already seeing changes in fundraising with the public advocate special election. Early data suggests that average contributions are getting smaller under the new program. So far, the most frequent contribution is $10 for public advocate candidates compared to $100 in previous elections. We also know that New York City has a diverse donor base within the matching funds program, and we see participation from contributors from all neighborhoods across the city. In terms of administering the public uh, matching funds program here in New York, a key component to ensuring the strength and integrity of the program is the board's <laughs> independent, nonpartisan structure. The board's independence and nonpartisan status ensure that the administration of the public matching funds program is not influenced by political pressures or agendas of the moment. We often work closely with the mayor and the city council on policy issues and legislative changes to strengthen the program. However, it is our independent administration of the public financing program and enforcement of the law that ensure we are, feeding, we are treating all candidates fairly, whether they are sitting elected officials or their challengers. This independence is critical to maintaining the public's confidence in the program and has been strengthened over time. The board's nonpartisanship is equally important to how we carry out our work. This differs from bipartisan structures, such as the Federal Elections Commission or the New York State uh, Board of Elections, which are evenly divided. Um, in a word, I think our system works better. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Who is? Ms. Lepresto is not speaking. Ms. Lepresto is not yes, speaking. I, but we are testimony is joint, so yes. Okay, so who should go next? Are you? you. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I, I, I do, I'm wondering, because some, some of what I say may be better after others speak. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Then I'll let the, let the Seattle. Gentlemen, um, Mr. Derning and Mr. Barnett, would you like to speak next? We would be uh, happy to. Okay. My name is Alan. My name is Alan Derning. I'm the founder and executive director of Sightline Institute. We are a public policy think tank based in Seattle. 
and I'm trying to see if I'm on the Skype. Um, and uh, I'm the person maybe most responsible for getting started the Seattle program. Uh, I can't see you right now. We do it that do it that the screen. You can't yeah. see us. Okay. That's, that's okay. We'll, we will move on. Um, what I thought I would do is uh, give you a little bit of the story of Seattle's Democracy Voucher Program, uh, tell you how it came about, and uh, and then in the question period, I'd be happy to talk about all of the details of the design, any of the details of the design that you care to speak about. And then um, perhaps uh, Mr. Barnett would then talk a little bit about the, the program and its basic design. Um, so <clears throat> Seattle had a public funding system for city council races some years ago, which was uh, which was stopped by a new state law. And then state law changed again in, what year was it, 2008 or something like that, 2010. And uh, the city council began studying public funding systems and actually brought forward a proposal that was based on um, New York's uh, uh, supermatch system, the one that you still operate. And uh, city council put that measure before the voters of Seattle, the voters of Seattle, um, almost approved it, but didn't quite do so. In 2014, um, in the wake of that almost victory for public funding of campaigns, uh, a, a citizens coalition assembled to, uh, to try again. And um, at the time, uh, there was no place in the world that had implemented a system of public funding through vouchers, though a number of academics and reformers had been talking about it for a long time. And so we thought, <clears throat> uh, we at Sightline thought, well, I wonder if Seattle might be a logical place to try this new idea and see whether it's a, um, maybe not necessarily a better method, but uh, an alternative method that would be a good tool for other localities and states to use elsewhere. Um, and we realized that Seattle was, to a certain extent, a natural laboratory for this voucher idea. Seattle, like all of the state of Washington, votes exclusively by mail. Um, the voters, therefore, are used to getting in the, uh, receiving in the mail packets from the election agencies um, and then mailing in their ballots, which we thought, well, that's just like a voucher system is going to need to be initially. Uh, Seattle is a city packed full of early adopters. Seattle has a relatively high level of trust in local government. People in Seattle are used to uh, local programs that provide them with recycling bins that get taken away and uh, energy saving light bulbs that they plug in and save energy, all kinds of things that, um, that uh, so, and Seattle is um, currently booming um, relatively high. Mr. Uh, Durning, could you yeah. start to wrap up, please? Absolutely. Um, so it seemed like a place where we could try uh, a different approach. We, we assembled a large coalition, ran a big campaign, and won with 64% of the voters. And then we said to the Seattle Ethics and Elections Commission, Mr. Barnett, implement the program. <laughs> Perfect segue, Alan. Mr. Barnett, <laughs> it's all yours. Take yeah. it away. All right, thank you very much for having us. Uh, I am the executive director of the agency that was in charge of implementing the voucher program. And let me just briefly just tell you what that entails. In January of 2017, we mailed to the roughly 500,000 registered Seattle voters four $25 vouchers apiece. And then it was our job to educate the public about what they could do with those vouchers um, to track the vouchers as they came back to our office and to send those to the county so that the signatures on those vouchers could be verified. And then at the final stage is we converted those $25 vouchers into contributions for the six candidates who participated in the program in its initial run in 2017. Uh, 2019 is also a municipal election year here in Seattle. We have already distributed our vouchers and are now in the process of, again, tracking them and converting them into campaign dollars. I do expect uh, participation in the program to be much higher in 2019 than in 2017. 
In 2017, there were only three races eligible to participate in the program. Um, two of those were held by um, established incumbents, and there was a one open seat, so most of the voucher candidates uh, vied in the open seat. Um, this year, we have seven district council races up. Four of those are open seats. We have had four retirements this year, so we're expecting a frenzy of activity this year and are looking forward to answering any of your questions about the program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Malbin? Okay. I'm just here uh, Thanks. doing whatever. Dr. Herwig. <laughs> I will go next. Um, so good evening and thank you so much for asking me to um, participate tonight. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Jen Herwig and I'm an assistant professor of sociology at SUNY Stony Brook. Uh, my research is broadly on the American campaign finance system and on how individual donors participate in the system, particularly, particularly in federal elections. So with my co-author at Georgetown, I've recently completed a study that looks at the effects of the 27 implementation of the Seattle Democracy Voucher Program. So as you know, and as Wayne already said, uh, the initiative in Seattle was the nation's first democracy voucher program. In January of 2017, Wayne mailed four $25 vouchers to every registered voter in the city. Those vouchers could be used for qualified candidates in two citywide city council races and the race for city attorney, all of which were held in November of 2017. In my study, I ask and answer two broad research questions about the effects of the voucher program that will be of interest to this commission. First, did the Seattle program increase the number of participants in the local campaign finance system? Here, I answer with an unqualified yes. The program dramatically increased the number of citizens who funded local elections. Compared to the number of cash donors in city council or city attorney races, the Democracy Voucher Program increased participation by 300%. Second, did the program diversify the donor pool? In just one partial implementation, the program has made some notable progress in diversifying campaign donors in local elections. So I'm gonna outline just a few of the findings from our research paper, which I included in my written testimony. Um, compared to local donors who made cash contributions, democracy voucher users are substantially more diverse. Democracy voucher users look more like voters in Seattle in terms of race, age, and income level. So for example, upper income citizens provided about 36 of the private contributions in 2017, but only 17% of the voucher funds. So in other words, the Democracy Voucher Program worked to reduce the overrepresentation of the wealthy among campaign donors. However, however, I wanna also note that voucher usage was still lower among communities of color, younger Seattleites, and those with lower levels of income, an aspect of the program that Seattle is working to improve in 2019. So to summarize, the Democracy Voucher Program increased participation in the local campaign finance system by over 300%. Those who participated in the program didn't look exactly like all voters in Seattle, but they were much more similar to Seattleites than those who made cash contributions, and I anticipate these, that these patterns will only improve in 2019. Thank you. Great. Jerry. Thanks. Oh, okay. Well, it's fine. No, Jerry, that's fine. I just need to do it. <laughs> that's... <laughs> should I should I go? Right. No, Jerry. Right. Uh, yeah. Is this on? No. no. If the red light is on, you're on. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Well, thanks for inviting me uh, tonight as to uh, part of the, your panels. I'm here tonight in my personal capacity as an election lawyer who has represented dozens of candidates in New York City, an adjunct professor of election law at Fordham Law School, a 1989 participant in the campaign finance laws. Uh, public matching uh, funds program and a student of the Charter Revision Commission. Um, I'm privileged to be joined here by the experts of the Campaign Finance Board, the Chair and the Executive Director and the folks from Seattle 
and they are obviously much more uh, familiar with the intricacies of the way the programs uh, work, and I'll leave it to them to answer your questions relating to those procedures. Uh, that said, I, wanna, I want to uh, reiter reiterate what uh, Chair uh, Schaefer said. There's no question that the New York City's 30-year uh, program is appropriately recognized as a great success. Our matching funds program has enabled many diverse candidates of modest means to run viable campaigns. And the staff and commissioners of the CFB have been assiduous in ensuring that the New York City's taxpayer dollars are distributed and used lawfully. Given the fact that millions of dollars are distributed to candidates in municipal elections, this is no small feat and, of course, extremely critical to the success of our program. There's always room for improvement of the program, and the CFB endeavors to update its procedures after every election. The question regarding the uh, democracy voucher program, uh, whether it should be substituted in part or in whole uh, to the CFB's current matching programs is before you tonight, and I want to address it very briefly. Uh, uh, um, first of all, you ought to know that the Commission, uh, uh, that the Seattle program's constitution constitutionality um, is being, still being litigated. It was challenged by uh, uh, plaintiffs, uh, plaintiff taxpayers in Seattle, represented by the Pacific Legal Foundation, and the trial court in Washington ruled that the case should be dismissed. Nevertheless, the plaintiffs have appealed, of course, and the intermediate uh, appellate court certified the appeal to the Washington State uh, Supreme Court, the highest court in Washington. This appeal has been briefed, and oral arguments are scheduled for May 14th, uh, 2019. Until the Supreme Court of Washington rules that, uh, and that the law is settled one way or the other as to the democracy voucher program's constitutionality, the Charter Commission, I think, may wish to withhold judgment as to whether or not the Seattle program should be imported into our campaign finance law. I just want to briefly make some observations, though, as to if you are going to consider it, uh, uh, it, it would be beneficial in a few ways. Um, a system in which public monies are distributed to the candidates directly by registered voters through vouchers compels the candidates to campaign more vigorously, not just for votes, but for financial support. This would enable less well-known candidates to become better known by attracting support one person at a time. It also compels the more well-known candidates to have to really press the flesh more assiduously in order to obtain the necessary funds for their campaign. In short, it's a process that, re can, that can result in a more robust person-to-person -person campaign. The voucher program also eliminates a great administrative burden now placed upon the CFB, having to track whether private contributions are eligible for matching funds. In this respect, the voucher program is more straightforward in that every registered voter's contribution can be used without further administrative burdens. Jerry? My last point, it saves the taxpayers a good deal of money potentially as well because the CFB currently awards to candidates whose races are not genuinely competitive. Rather than the sometimes charade by certain candidates who claim that their opponents are real, the marketplace will demonstrate through the voucher program which candidates can actually attract sufficient funds to run a viable campaign. This contrasts with the CFB having to distribute matching funds to candidates who claim to have competitive races but really do not. The Thank city you. would thus save significant sums of tax taxpayer dollars if we use the, the voucher program. My last point is if you're going to consider it and if you're going to adopt it, it obviously ought not to take effect until after the 2021 elections because people are already raising money uh, for uh, the coming elections. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Melvin. Thank you. I'm, uh, my name is Michael Melvin, professor of political science at uh, University of Albany, SUNY. I'm also a director of the um, 
uh, co-founder and director of the Campaign Finance Institute, which is a nonpartisan research institute specializing in money and politics. Um, I've uh, written for some time that, that the city's matching fund program uh, has been and should continue to be a model for the nation. Um, it has produced an impressive increase in the number and demographic diversity of donors. Uh, but the 2017 election saw a drop in the importance of small donors. In addition, the results were never as impressive for citywide candidates as for city council. So in 2018, the Mayor's Charter Revision Commission, <clears throat> to which um, we were technical consultants, recommended increasing the matching rate to eight to one while reducing the contribution limits. 80% of the voters improved. Now, only a few months later, we're being asked whether the city should change again. Like many of my colleagues, I have been intrigued by the Seattle experiment, which has been uh, uh, implemented in a very impressive way. Um, uh, Professor Herbig's research has shown positive results for 2017, as we've heard. But despite these positives, I would urge you not to adopt a voucher system for New York City at this time. As Alan has said, uh, this is the first voucher system in the world. It has had only one election with only a handful of races. The first mayoral election will not be until 2021. Even if the system does do better the, with vouchers than Seattle before vouchers, that's really not the question before you. Uh, uh, the, the tougher question is whether vouchers on balance would be better than what's already in place. Maybe yes, but we'll know a lot more in just a little while. We need time. We need more time because the voucher system effects go well beyond participation numbers. We need time to see whether there are unintended consequences, some of which I speculate about in the longer written testimony. My recommendation is to let the 8 to 1 system work for at least one full cycle without further changes. 80% of the voters said yes, let's see how it works and let's compare it to others such as Seattle and Montgomery County and others. At the same time, the City Council should commit or consider a new commission made up mostly of scholars. Uh, its job should be to compare the strengths and weaknesses of the various kinds of new public financing systems to each other, not to nothing, but to each other. Uh, no one anywhere, whether scholarly or anywhere, has done this. It should report back to the City Council after New York's and Seattle's elections of 2021. At that point, you could deliberate based on fact and not on speculation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to actually ask the first question. Um, Mr. Barnett and Mr. Durney, you said that there are approximately 500 registered voters in Seattle proper. What yes. is the number of eligible voters? In our voter Who may not be registered. Our voter registration rate is very high. I don't exactly know what it is, but New York, Washington State is a very um, voter friendly uh, place. We vote the, the, you can register to vote when you register, get your driver's license. It is, I believe it's quite high, but I don't know that number off the top of my head. I, I think uh, about half a million registered voters. I think there were something like 70 to 80,000 uh, additional eligible voters, voters when we were doing the design exercise a couple years ago. So as Wayne said, a very high registration rate. But it's an additional incentive to register that you get to participate in the voucher program, and uh, we thought that was an added benefit. Well, that's my question. Did you see the number of registered voters go up and the number of unregistered but eligible voters decrease? Uh, well, or is there just not enough experience to... Well, Right. So again, this we did the, the first round, 2017, was three races. Um, uh, it, it's an off-year election. Registration tends to drop down anyway. Registration goes up and down, as Professor Herwig and others can tell you, um, based on the, uh, the salience of the election, whether there's a presidential race going on. So we haven't studied it. I doubt, though, that it would be early enough to tell 
to what to what degree people were registering in order to get the vouchers. Uh, again, this was the first time most people in the city had never heard about it until they got vouchers in their mailbox, and many people in the city didn't even notice the vouchers. So it'll take a few cycles before everyone knows what it is. So we had a phenomenal increase in participation. Um, I, I'm sure there are anecdotes of people registering in order to get it, but whether it increased the registration overall, we don't know yet. One other thing which I should point out is that non-registered voters are also eligible to participate in the voucher program. Uh, so if you are a legal permanent resident or a U.S. national, you are eligible to make a federal campaign contribution and therefore also eligible to participate in the voucher program. So it is not only registered voters who can partake, participate in the voucher program. Though, what, you had maybe 60, 50 people sign up for that? <laughs> I think a little bit more than that, but not many. Not many more. <laughs> Alan's digging me there. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Sal, yeah. you're next. Uh, and then Carl. Yeah, I, I, I was uh, a member of the uh, council when we passed this law. Uh, it was spurred on by pay-to-play scandals in the Koch administration. And by the way, as a council member, I participated in the plan as, as a candidate before and after the uh, campaign finance uh, plan was was passed. And uh, there was no problem raising the money needed to, to wage a city council race. The problem that we have with this program is on a citywide basis. That's the problem that we have here. And in a strong mayoral system that we have in New York, that's significant because that impacts the public more than anything when it comes to pay-to-play corruption. Now, I've seen more pay-to-play corruption the last seven or eight years than I did during the Koch administration under this plan. The U.S. attorney said the favors were, were being done for large donors. I can't, I, I, would, I don't have time to list all of the investigations that were related to bundling money by lobbyists and developers under this system. Now, I say, why should we continue a program that has done nothing to mitigate corruption, 85% of the money towards citywide races in 2017 came from high, more than high medium zip codes. People of color are virtually invisible as donors, where under the, under the system in Seattle, I as a candidate could go into Queensbridge houses, knock on the door of a vote and say, uh, Mrs. Uh, McGillicuddy, I'm running for mayor. I would love for you to donate my voucher. Why shouldn't we adopt a system that's fairer, more inclusive, and addresses the, the, in, the, the legislative intent, the legislative intent of the 1989 law, which, by the way, I, I voted reluctantly for. I had the Albanese Clean Elections Act, which is modeled after Maine. I never thought this was the ideal plan. And unfortunately, I was proven right. We're spending thousands, millions of dollars administratively and, and for a program that does not really meet its legislative intent. And most of the people that benefit from it are insiders, not grassroots candidates. So please is that a question? answer me. Yeah, the question is, why shouldn't we, we adopt a better plan? You guys could administer that as well. You probably have to cut three quarters of your staff, but that's okay. Who's that question for? <laughs> I'll, I'll take I'll take the first I'll take the first shot at it. Uh, uh, it's for the, the entire panel. Oh, I was also around then, and we were both a little bit younger. Yes, that we, I had hair then, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so I, I agree with some of your criticisms. The the campaign finance law I think has been an enormous success in many ways, but on the citywide and particularly the mayoral elections, it has had less of an impact than we would have liked, and that's why. Uh, the last Charter Revision Commission proposed, and the voters uh, approved uh, a proposal to increase the match from 6 to 1 to 8 to 1, and to decrease the maximum contribution from $5,100 to 2000 I think that's a major change, and I expect, as we're beginning to see already with the public advocates race, uh, that uh, it, it's going to result in the citywide of offices also uh, large contributions playing a decreasing role and smaller contributions playing an increasing role. Jerry, did you want to respond? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with what um, was just said. But you know what? You can go into Queensbridge houses, introduce yourself, 
give them some literature, and ask them for a contribution. It's not the same as them parting with a voucher. That's true. But we both know, we all know, that fundraising is difficult, but there are very creative ways of um, uh, increasing uh, the, 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 the diversity of those who participate. That said, um, uh, we have a we have a we have a system, we have a model. No, well, we we have a model now that is working very effectively, and you you may not you may I, not think so. It works effectively for the most part for most candidates, and as a matter of fact, I, I think that I think that you'll agree that we uh, the the diversity of candidates over the life of this program in the last 30 years has changed tremendously for the better uh, and is much more representative of the population of New York City. That doesn't mean it can't be improved. And this eight to one is an improvement and the lower of the contribution level is, is an improvement. And by the way, I don't know that we need to really consider uh, uh, reviewing the eight to one match because it's not really different substantively as the six to one match program. It's pretty much the same. Thank you for that. So I I'm not so sure that we need to put off, if we want to consider the voucher program, I'm not sure that we need to put off studying it um, and analyzing it to see how the eight to one program uh, works. I disagree with Professor Malbin in that. So all of that said, um, it seems to me that the program that we have works for the most part, has improved uh, most of the races in the sense that more, more people who are less connected to wealth are able to run. We have a greater diversity of people who, who are able to run. That doesn't mean we can't have uh, uh, a study as to whether or not we should include this, maybe even as a pilot program for one race, maybe for a public advocate or maybe for a city council race in in a particular borough or several in different uh, different boroughs. Uh, maybe that would be useful. Well, Jerry, the stats don't bear out that it's working. It's just that. Yeah, uh, may, I, may I disagree with, uh, with with some of the premise of this question? Um, I mean, we've actually done a lot of research on the census block groups where people come from. Where do the donors come from? Uh, we've compared it uh, before, after. We've compared it to different level races. Um, there is an incredible, uh, there is very high percentage in, in poor neighborhoods in city council races. You are correct about mayoral races. That is where the problem was, and so, the contribution it wasn't merely a change from six to one to eight to one. It, that was coupled with a very substantial reduction in the contribution limit. Uh, uh, I do not. I do not think we are can be sure how exactly how the system will work. And I think, with all due respect, that that positive results in three city council districts in Seattle do not constitute a fair test of that system comparative to the other system. We have two systems with relatively positive results, and you haven't studied them both together. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this is a question for Mr. Durning or perhaps for Jerry Goldfeder, but what is the basis for the um, constitutional or unconstitutional claim before the Washington State Supreme Court? Well, the way I understand it, and perhaps my friends uh, from Seattle will uh, either correct me or amplify my remarks, but the way I understand it is that taxpayer dollars are being used and there are people who are not residents of the city, but yet pay taxes to the city, and therefore they claim that their, tax pay, their taxpayer dollars are being used in a system in which they cannot uh, have, they have no voice 
um, um, as to how those taxpayer dollars are using, being used. They can't vote, and yet uh, their money is uh, being distributed to uh, voters to contribute to candidates. That's, so, I think that's the nub of it. So if I, if I understand, and I'm not here to litigate that claim, but if I understand the claim, that would be a, a similar claim could be uh, made ag against what is now the New York system, which is, a after all, um, uses taxpayer dollars as well, and, um, and the New York system has been obviously um, uh, well sustained over a 30 year period now. Is that, is that a fair statement? I, is I, there, I think that if somebody brought that claim when the program started, they might have been successful. But given the fact that uh, we've had 30 years and, and the program, a different oh. aspect of the program was just challenged unsuccessfully, I think my view is that anybody who wants to challenge our program will not uh, succeed. May, may, well, may I mean, I, just to, to play this out of one more step. Yeah. Um, in addition to your, uh, I think, appropriate um, uh, caution that we shouldn't do anything until the Supreme Court of Washington uh, has ruled, um, in a certain way, since this would be a new system, it would it would uh, allow a litigant here to open something up that uh, because we have a 30-year track record, we wouldn't necessarily want to see opened up. I think that's a fair point. Thank you. If I just might add, th there was such a case brought uh, early on in this system uh, in the uh, Federal District Court in the Southern District of New York. The claim was rejected. No appeal was taken. But your point is right that you change the system just enough so that somebody could distinguish it, and then you're off to the races all over again. Thanks. I can't hear you. Uh, Mr. Derning or Mr. Barnett, did you want to respond to the last question from, uh, yeah. from Carl? Mr. Bar Mr. Barnett uh, teaches at uh, one of our local law schools, so I'll answer the question. Uh, <laughs> uh, we were astonished that, this, that the appeal was accepted by the Supreme Court. We're waiting to see uh, why the court took it, um, because the claim, it's, the claim was astonishingly broad and based on um, claims that have been dismissed repeatedly in other in other cases so i don't think you need to worry about it too much but it'll be curious to see we'll be curious to see what happens now we'll let the actual law professor say something i would just be cautious i'm, I'm leery of being overconfident uh especially because the next appeal after our state supreme court would of course be the united states supreme court right and in the wake of the janus opinion i think compelled speech is a new, gotten some new currency, so I'm yeah. I'm concerned. I'm not I'm not I'm not laying people off, but I'm concerned. I, I would agree. I I the uh, I think the 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 the, comp the complaint against our system was written, I think, sort of as a um, as a hail mary pass to try to get something into the federal courts, um, in in hopes that maybe it would uh, be heard by a different Supreme Court, and that we that that the net effect would not just uh, affect um, the Seattle system, but public funding systems everywhere. So um, again, I, I'm not an attorney, but I have very strong views on this matter. Thank you very much. Uh, Lindsay was next, and then Sal, and then uh, Jim Karras. Uh, thank you all for your time and your uh, testimony today. I <clears throat> Uh, forgive me, as I'm, I'm not the individual in my family who checks the mail, but I think I got very nervous um, when you mentioned that you all the vouchers are distributed to people via mail, and they have to return them also via mail. I think at a scale of eight and a half million people, obviously that's not the full number of registered voters, 
or eligible voters, that, that seems daunting to me. So I guess my, my question for our colleagues in Seattle, and I guess Mr. Malbin, or you noted that, or someone noted that, it may be being implemented in Montgomery County also. Um, no? Okay. Um, di, or as you maybe evangelize or talk about this, is there another method for implementation that maybe it's electronic or something that isn't just the Postal Service? I'll do respect to them. They do a valuable service. I can take that one. We are this week debuting an online portal where Seattle residents will be able to assign their vouchers online. I think the reason we did not go to that exclusively is the, the fear of the digital divide. Um, people who don't have reliable internet access are often the very people this program is intended to assist. So we are going to continue mailing these, but yes, we are rolling out an online voucher system this week. Sorry, and, 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 one, and one follow up on that, are you, are you doing that in a way that, that tends to try to reach those people, um, maybe via a mobile first optimization or an app rather than a traditional website? Right now it's just the website. We do this program on a shoestring budget. We collect $3 million a year in property taxes for the next 10 years. Uh, Ideally, most of that will go to candidates, uh, candidate campaigns. So we are doing this in, in baby steps. Uh, Thank you. Commissioner, Commissioner, yes. if I may, um, can I ask you to ask him how they're protecting the uh, submission of vouchers through the internet when we have so much evidence that uh, the internet is not exactly uh, secure? Sure. The, uh, um, I know it's not appropriate for me to ask a question, but I thought it was interesting to, to hear how that's going to happen. Did I'm, you not, guys a, hear I'm that? not a tech guy. I will plead that my computer is basically a glorified typewriter for me, but we have been, we've been engaged our IT department and, and we are confident that these will be as secure as they possibly can be. I think one of the issues, you know, there's been a lot of talk in our system about fraud, but the fact is, is like every resident gets only $100 to give. So it is difficult to imagine pulling off a fraud in a way that could swing a campaign with $100 a piece, $100 at a time. So again, I'm not inviting that, but it is, that's, that's kind of where we did not see much in the way of fraud the first time. Sal? Yeah, uh, just in, in terms of litigation, Jerry, we're, we're both attorneys. We know these, these, these programs are challenged all the time. Maine was challenged. We were challenged. They're going to be challenged. And in terms of the Supreme Court, I mean, if that, if, if the, as the gentleman from Seattle said, if, if we're impacted by that, uh, uh, by that very conservative court, uh, this program gets wiped out through everything gets wiped out. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think that's a that's a major issue. Uh, I, uh, by the way, Austin and Albuquerque are also moving in the direction of democracy vouchers. It'll be on the ballot uh, there in in, in uh, the next election. And there's a lot of support for it. I, I have one question uh, for the campaign finance board. If Seattle was able to discern how many people of color contributed. To campaigns and under the democracy voucher, when they have they have actual numbers, why doesn't the campaign finance board have those numbers? You have zip codes, but it doesn't tell me any of that. Um, as Professor Malbin stated, we you know our you know there's been there's a contributor in 93 percent of every census block district in New York City, um, so we don't collect demographic information from the contributors. Uh, that would require us to ask the candidates as they're collecting contributions, to ask demographic in, uh, information from every contributor that they have to get that information, and we don't think that that's an appropriate uh, government <laughs> to ask every person who's contributing what their uh, demographics well, are, but that's why we use census block districts as kind of a uh, stand-in for that. And since 93% of census block districts have at least one contributor, I think you can understand that there is a wide variety of demographics contributing to candidates in the city. So, yeah. can we just ask um, Mr. Mr. Barnett whether 
how Seattle collects this data? Good. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. We did not collect that data. That was really, that was the researchers. It was actually Professor Herwig and Brian McKay from Georgetown who did uh, most of the research in terms of, I think they use proprietary so databases. I believe Professor Herwig might be the person to answer this question better about how they determined, you know, with some degree of confidence, someone's race, race or ethnicity. Can you, can you answer that question? Sure. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of voter lists. Um, this data is readily available for voter every <clears throat> city and state in the U.S. Um, at the individual level, and uh, uh, New York City's voter list as well as Seattle's voter list includes a race variable. That variable is uh, what we would call imputed, which means that unless the state collects it, which uh, Washington State does not, um, the proprietary um, data will actually um, model whether you're white or African American or Asian. Now that might sound to you like um, it's a not a very accurate process, but there have been uh, a number of validation studies now that have shown that this is about 95% accurate for determining the race of an individual. 95%? About 95%, there's a, an extensive Pew report that um, compared a variety of different uh, voter lists and found very high confidence in the race variables in particular. So I feel pretty, I particularly am a very uh, cautious researcher and I find those results very compelling and very, um, uh, very, very uh, robust. Don't you think we should have that data? Don't you think that's important? It's not within our purview to conduct that study, but if academics, I would be happy to do you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have a bomb. I mean, well, uh, we can have a conversation when this uh, hearing's over. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mr. Karras. Put all of this in a context for me. Uh, um, is it not? It's not. Yeah. Uh, to put all this in a context for me. Uh, what other elements are there of the Seattle uh, public finance uh, system? Uh, is there an opt-out provision? Are there contribution limits? I mean, I, I just want to put this piece of it in the context of the whole system. Uh, may I? Sure. Uh, that's an excellent question. The Democracy Voucher Program was one component of a citizen initiative which uh, enhanced and amended uh, existing uh, campaign finance rules, which Mr. Barnett's commission um, adjudicates and enforces. It, we reduced the overall contribution limit for all campaigns in the city to um, $500. Um, if you want to use the vouchers, you have to sign a pledge to limit your top contribution to $250 for most races, though we left it at $500 for the mayor's race. You also have to limit your total spending um, and in order to participate, you have to demonstrate broad, uh, uh, wide uh, support in the community by collecting signatures and $10 contributions from prescribed numbers of, uh, of residents, of, of voters in the city. Uh, and if you're running for a particular district, a number of voters in your district. There are a number of other restrictions and uh, requirements that are included in the pledge. As you all know, all uh, public funding systems are opt-in for the candidate uh, because of uh, federal court rulings. So ours is an opt-in system. And one of the, one of the great successes that, uh, that, that I'm excited about from the 2017 cycle and the 2019 cycle that's just beginning is that almost all serious candidates are opting into the system, which makes me think we have, we've set it up right so that people believe they can run and win under this program. So it's working not only for, the, uh, for voters, but also for candidates. I'd be happy to, tell, to, tell, uh, to, to, to provide you more information about the program, and the Seattle website describes it all as well. I guess my concern would be doing something like this and encouraging people to opt out if you don't structure it correctly, uh, especially in uh, city, you know, mayoral races, high profile races. Uh, has anyone studied that? 
I haven't studied it, but if you, um, in my written testimony, the, in the research paper, there's uh, some more details of the program. Um, even though it's an opt-in system, candidates to actually qualify for the program have to dem demonstrate grassroots support by collecting low dollar donations and a certain number of signatures. So for Wayne, I might get this wrong, but for um, city council, it was um, 400 qualifying donations and signatures and then 150 uh, signatures for city attorney in 2017. Um, so it's, it's not the case that anybody who is interested in the program can opt in. They actually have to do some work in the community before they become a qualified candidate to receive the vouchers. May, may, I, may I chime in with one additional important fact is that we, we designed the program uh, to give a lot of latitude to the uh, commission that administers the program so that the, the commission that supervises Wayne has authority between election cycles to adjust many of the variables of the program in order to uh, keep participation up. So if it turns out that lots of candidates begin to opt out, the commission, for example, can increase the dollar value of vouchers that each person get, can increase the um, number of signatures that are required to qualify, can increase the spending limit that candidates agree to, and some other things as well. It's because we think that uh, campaign finance is uh, constantly changing. Campaigns adjust and adapt, and uh, we wanted to give as many tools as possible to the program so that it could maintain its relevance throughout its life. And if I could just point out that five of the six general election candidates eligible to participate in the program in 2017 did participate. And thus far in 2019, I think we have about 40 candidates registered to participate in the in to run for office, and 30 of those have opted into the program. So roughly 75% of candidates to date have chosen to participate in the program. And what percentage did the democracy voucher money represent? of the total funds that the candidates collected and spent? It was quite high. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but uh, oh, yeah, the yeah. two city council at the at-large race, the two candidates raised and spent $300,000. They both maxed out, um, and I don't think they raised much more than that. Uh, I believe it was, I believe it was, uh, between 70 and 80 percent for the two candidates in the contested race, 75 to 80 percent of their funds came from the Democracy Voucher program. A somewhat smaller percentage for the uncontested races, but those were very low. Those those other races, um, there weren't a lot of money spent. So, um, just by collecting uh, the cash contributions from people's friends and neighbors, they you know they raised a fair bit of their total budget. Did you say 70% of the $300,000 that they raised was from democracy vouchers? That's correct. We'll, we'll have to get you the exact number, but my, my recollection is that it was, a, it was between 70 and 80%. And can I just ask how many voters were in these in the, these districts? I believe there are about 70,000 no, voters. Statewide. For, oh, statewide, C I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, citywide. These were city, citywide races, so it would have been every voter. Yes, oh. I, I thought you were talking about, our districts are 70,000 voters, but our the three races in 2017 were all at-large races. So okay. they each comprised, everyone in the city was eligible to vote in those races. Okay, thank you, are there? I have one question. Sal? I want to, Mr. Durney, um, I'd love to ask your opinion of um, the voucher democracy system versus the matching system. Do you have any viewpoints on that? There are very few questions on which I do not have a viewpoint. Uh, I can attest to that. <laughs> well, the first thing I would say is that we studied uh, the New York system closely, and we thought it was one of the best ones around. Um, when the, when the, the Citizens Coalition that was assembling the, uh, the, the proposal that ultimately went to the voters in 2015, at, at one point we were considering two options. One was to replicate what New York had done with what we call a super match, six to one super match, or to do this democracy voucher thing. And for a while it was touch and go. The, the argument for, for, for replicating the New York system was that it was proven. We could just copy 
uh, what you guys did and maybe hire away your election administrators or your your, your campaign your campaign finance board. We could just hire them to come work here. Um, but uh, ultimately, the argument um, that swayed the swayed the, the coalition uh, were the arguments that um, that that many of you have been making today. I mean, democracy vouchers are the most democratizing and egalitarian method of public funding for a campaign that has been invented yet. It makes every eligible participant in the city worth the same amount to a candidate, whether they're a bartender or a bank president, whether it's a someone who is suffering homelessness or the head of a major union, they're both they, they're worth the same amount to the to the candidate, a hundred bucks, and uh, it and it gives a path to office that through which you spend your time entirely engaging in voter contact. You spend all of your time talking to people, or you know going to house parties or. Um, it's all it's a way to combine people power with funding your campaign and it's it proved more successful in its first um, iteration than I had allowed myself to hope we had um, the campaign was in the, sorry the the program was in fact oversubscribed more citizens participated than we had modeled for um, so i'm I'm a proponent of democracy voucher program but I think you guys have a pretty darn good one to begin with Could I just uh, ask how much the program costs? So in the maximum cost, I guess, would be $50 million, but what was the participation rate? So how many, how the, much did it actually the, cost? Yeah. Well, um, let me explain the theory, and then Wayne can tell you the actual, actual thing, what it, what it cost. The very common misunderstanding is that the total potential budget would be the face value of all the vouchers in circulation. That's not the total potential that could be spent. The total is the sum of the spending limits of all the candidates who qualify, um, which is a much, much smaller number. So the, the program is um, funded with a $3 million a year special property tax levy that the voters approved in 2015. Uh, and Wayne, why don't you tell them what it actually costs to run? Um, it cost us 1.14 million is what we distributed to candidates in 2017. It cost us to administer the program just about a million dollars in 2017. I don't think that that ratio will hold. I don't think it will always be one to one. I think as we see more candidates participating in the program, I think our administrative costs will largely hold steady. Thank you. You're welcome. I thought you were saying somebody, Mike, and I didn't know who Mike was. I didn't. <laughs> um, but I, I, I'd like to thank all of you for participating with us and for sharing your knowledge and your views with us. And I would hope that if we have additional questions or concerns or we invite you back or we call you to ask you to follow up on any of the things you've said, that you would be available. With that being said, the business of today's meeting is concluded. Uh, our next forum will be on Thursday, March 7th at 6 p.m., and that will be on police accountability focus area. Um, while you're more than welcome to take away the written materials, if you could leave your little blue folders behind, that would be helpful for us so we can use them again. May I have a... Motion to adjourn, and I have a motion right here. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned until March 7th. Great job, my dear. Thank you. Thank you.